I just wanted to make a joke about the first row being like in school back in the day when everything's empty, but apparently last guys arriving need to take the back seats. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for showing up after a barbecue. Um, to be honest, didn't expect that, but great. Um, today I'm going to talk about the hard truth of cloud native software supply chain security. Um, I'm a senior DevOps engineer working at Fullstacks. We build Kubernetes and cloud native platforms. Um, just a little show of hands. How many guys here are also into the DevOps space? Okay, at least some people. Great. <laughs> um, so actually, that's that's my disclaimer. I'm not one of your hardcore security guys. I'm not a pen test. I'm not a red teamer. I'm one of the DevOps engineers that actually tries to build secure um, cloud native platforms, Kubernetes uh, platforms. And this is a story of the point of view of a guy like me um, that wants to talk about the supply chain um, impediments I see that companies don't do right and where they could do better. So that's not a hardcore security point of view, but a point of view from an engineer that builds the platform. Um, my goal is to provide you some ideas um, of cloud native soft supply chain security best practices. I'm trying to give you some cheap and expensive examples for controls that companies should or could implement to increase security. Um, and I would also share my concerns about the current state that we see in the industry. Um, that's actually the reason I decided to give this talk and look into this topic more because I was astonished at actually how bad companies do. Um, yeah, but we're going to see that in the in the second part. All right. Um, now, before we can talk about the threats and the current state, etc., we need to have a look at what is the uh, software supply chain security actually, and especially always try to think of it in terms of the cloud native way of doing things. So cloud focused, Kubernetes focused, everything is containerized, etc. Um, Melara and Bowman made a very nice paper depicting what uh, software supply chain actually is, and they state that the software supply chain um, involves a multitude of tools and processes that enable software developers to write, build, and ship applications, which implies that the runtime, the target system, is actually by definition not part of the software supply chain, but everything that is um, included until there. So all the build machines, the source code, the dependencies, etc. Um, we're going to have a look at that in a minute, but not the target system itself. So we're not going to talk about runtime security today, but everything that is actually uh, needed to build software that's going to be delivered and run on somebody else's machine. All right. Um, the CNCF provides a neat model that um, describes software supply chain in a nutshell. Um, it's pretty much to the traditional supply chain we see in uh, production companies. So whereas we have materials, production, means of production, logistics, retailers, and the end customer in a traditional supply chain, we see pretty much the same thing in the software supply chain. So instead of the raw materials, we have everything that's source code, dependencies. Instead of the, fab uh, the, um, the fabrics and the, the manufacturers, we have build systems. We have engineers that actually kind of transform source code into a product. Instead of logistics and transportation, we have networks that transport our artifacts and our products. And instead of the retailers, we have some kind of a repository registry that actually provides artifacts and, and tools to the final destination, if you will, um, to the systems that the artifacts are going to be deployed to. SIS provides pretty much the same picture, but they focus more on the threats um, of this supply chain. So as you can see, we are pretty much aligned throughout the, uh, the literature of what the supply chain actually looks like. Um, they try to, to highlight at least some threats that we should consider. Of course, there is a gazillion of threats through all of the stages. We're also going to talk about that in a minute. But that's just an overview that, for example, we should consider preventing malicious code if we talk about source code. Um, we should consider having um, a, a proper integrity of dependencies that we use. Um, we should to consider to monitor and analyze the pipelines we use if we build software. And of course, we should also ensure the integrity of the artifact we build and we ship to our end customers um, because we don't want to run into any um, supply chain security incidents related to our software that we produce. All these threats that we've seen before and that we're going to see in a minute now will, at the end, affect some of the um, three magic um, parts of software, supply, of software security. It will either affect the integrity of the source code or the artifact that we produce or the service that we provide with the software. 
it could potentially um, affect the availability. So if you have compromised software, it will probably um, affect the availability of the service that we provide with this software. And it could provide confidentiality of data that we handle with software. Either one of them or even uh, multiple of these um, of these domains could be affected if we ship um, malicious or if, if we ship corrupted software or if we have a problem in the software supply chain. Okay, now let's have a look at the different stages that we're going to look at. And then we're also going to have a look at how the implementation rate of certain control in the market really is. Um, the stages we're going to have a look at is the self-written code. So actually what, what we as software developers write on our machine. We're going to have a look at the dependencies, which at the end of the day is just the code of somebody else. We're going to have a look at the pipeline and uh, the pipeline and the build that's transforming source code into some kind of artifact. We're going to have a look at the artifact and its distribution or deployment, but we're not going to have a look at the runtime since by definition that's not part of the supply chain and it would definitely um, explode the, the content of this talk. All right. First thing to talk about is our code. What I write as a developer and the thing we need, uh, the thing we need to to distinguish there is actually the content of the code. So what could actually go wrong with writing code and the management of the code. In terms of content, we have pretty much simple threads. We have bugs. That's everything that could compromise the software we deliver unintentionally. Um, some mistakes a developer makes, performance impacts, etc., etc., that will have effects on integrity, availability, or confidentiality of the software we produce or the data we handle. We could also have the threat of malicious code. So actually somebody introducing code with malicious intent to our code base. And we also have the threat of leaking secrets, either credentials or, um, for example, hard-coded secret data that we don't want to have in the final artifact or that we don't want to have spoiled um, and made public. To cope with threats like these, um, I bring you some, some cheap examples that you can implement. That's actually one of the first thing each part of framework and literature, uh, uh, and, uh, framework uh, in, in literature will recommend is to have some kind of scanners. We, for example, we have secret detection scanners. Something that I run in my pre-commit file or in my Git repository that will detect personal access tokens, SSH keys, stuff like that. Um, short example here on the left hand side that will just make me aware that I should or shouldn't push this commit to the remote since I have some, some secret in there or that will at least make me aware that a secret was found in already published code. So I could, for example, revoke a, a personal access token or something like that. Um, we also have infrastructure as code scanners, which are usually focused on misconfigurations. So for example, if I have Terraform code or Azure ARM or Kubernetes manifests, these scanners will make me aware that, for example, I have unencrypted uh, file storages or open ports, stuff like that, misconfiguration usually. And the typical SAS scanners that will make me aware of code smells, um, of, of possible um, exploits that could be done there, like I know secret uh, SQL injections or stuff like that, um, to not make any security relevant um, um, bugs or failures in my own code. And this is actually quite cheap because I just need to use a tool, run the scan, and this will make me aware of the most um, most most prominent problems out there. So for a company, it's actually quite cheap to, to at least introduce a scanner and to use it. The expensive thing, on the other hand, just as an example, is testing. Now, this might sound a little counterintuitive since everybody's writing tests, obviously. Everybody's having a code coverage right above 80, 85 percent, of course. But in practice, that's just not the case. Because to really have a good code coverage and a good test base, you need to consider so many things. You need to have, or you should have unit tests to test your single piece of, um, of modularized um, software, system tests, integration tests. Um, but then the fun starts if you want to have end-to-end -end tests. You need to deploy the whole thing. You need to test each chain. And the new kit on the block, which is actually quite neat, especially for security purposes, is to have trace tests where you actually um, hit an API, for example. You have a look at the traces and the spans that this uh, API call will trigger. And then you build test cases and assertions based on the path the request takes. If you want to do that right, that's expensive because you need to do it for every piece of software, for every method, every function you write. Um, you should have a pretty neat code coverage. And you also need to do something with the results. So speaking from a company perspective, 
that's actually quite expensive because everybody needs to do it and everybody needs to do it right and needs to do it right all the time. The second thing with source code is actually source code management. Now, the threats here are actually quite simple. First, we have the threat of manipulation. I could have somebody compromise my source code management system and manipulate the code, um, introduce mal uh, malicious code into my code base, which is basically at the end of the day uh, an effect of, of integrity. I could have the problem of theft. So here we're talking about industry espionage, intellectual property, this stuff. Um, so I actually want to make sure that unauthorized people are not able to steal my code. And of course, I should also make sure that nobody is able to delete my code. Um, since this could also have some probably bad business implications. Again, here we have some cheap and some more expensive controls that we can implement. Um, as I said before, this is just, just an example. So there's a, a gazillion of, of, of controls you should consider. But that's what we see in, in the wild, for example, companies not using signed commits. It's Quite easy if I have a GitLab or GitHub or Bitbucket, um, whatever. It's just a tick of a button and I can roll it out company-wide. It's easy to implement. It's easy to make use of. But for some reason, companies are not making use of it in the way they should. Second thing, multi-factor authentication. It's also a thing that's just a tick of a box. It's actually quite easy to set up. It's not a big of an effort. No um, source, uh, source code management vendor will charge you for these features as well. So that's pretty much free of charge everywhere. But it's also things we see that are not implemented in many companies. Especially for security people, that's probably a no-brainer. Um, but for developers, sometimes not that much. The more expensive things um, to, to this side of code is, for example, if you want to have more fine-grained um, access control in your repository, in your source code, you could, for example, make use of something like a code owner's file. Um, this will give you access restriction to certain files and certain paths and folders within the Git repository, which is actually quite neat if you want to have, for example, some, some critical part of your application and you only want to have certain teams or developers um, being able to change that code or configuration or such. That's something um, that is potentially useful. I had never seen that in the wild before. And the other thing that we try to use a lot and we also try to recommend to our customers is to use some kind of a, a pre-commit tool um, that actually executes, checks, scans, etc., before the local commit even gets through. So it's kind of a Git hook, good fe uh, Git feature. This might sound quite easy, but again, as we've seen with the tests before, the content of this file, the configuration, and to make that um, uh, an organization-wide standard that's, a, that's actually quite expensive because you're making a hard block for your developers. You only want to block um, malicious um, code or checks that should definitely fail. And to create this um, this, this baseline, this policy, company-wide that says, hey, I'm going to block a hard cut here that a, uh, a developer is actually not able to commit locally um, or even then push to the remote. That's actually a very hard implication and that's very expensive for companies to get into the field. Little show of hands. Um, who of you is already using multi-factor authentication for, for source code repositories? Okay, 30, 50%. All right. That's the cheap one. More expensive one. Do you even use pre-commit or some kind of sophisticated push policies for repositories? Some of you, or even, even fewer hands. Okay, that's about the picture we're going to see at the end of the talk. <laughs> okay, second thing um, is dependencies. Now, dependencies relate to pretty much everything um, we see as packages, libraries, but in the cloud native field, also stuff, for example, like base images, um, which is a pretty, pretty big topic um, if you're into the containerized world. Um, the one shout out here, please use a package manager because all, or pretty much all of the security um, controls we see somewhat rely on a, on a kind of a package manager. And it's not a joke. I've been, I've worked at a pretty big company and they told me, well, What's, what, what's package manager? I don't, I don't need this. I mean, we have all our files on the share for 20 years now. Still works. It's not stupid if it works. Okay. The threat, the, the threats we see here is pretty much the same as we have seen with our own source code. Of course, bugs and malicious code, since dependencies are just somebody else's code. But we also have the problem of license. So this might not be, um, a security problem per se. But if we use the wrong license, especially if we're making use of open source software, 
we could hit a legal hurdle where we actually need to open source our internal code as well. And if we do, uh, if we develop something that's kind of an, um, uh, hard intellectual property, that's probably a bad thing for us. Um, since we might also have to publish our code ourselves. And the second thing we need to consider when it comes to dependencies is integrity that we need to make sure that we actually use the right dependency so that we take the artifact that we intend to use and that it's actually the thing we want to have. Um, as for the cheap control, we can see here, the first thing is an inventory. Um, who around here was affected by the log4j? The weekend at Friday when they published, there's a 10 out of 10 CVE and who was on duty? Okay, I see some hands. Me too. I worked at a company, 12,000 people, about 400 developers. And yeah, I got a, <laughs> got a call from my, from my CISO and he was like, Daniel, where do we use log4j? I was like, I don't know. We have about 12,000 VMs. Heck do I know? So that's what you need inventory management for. At the end of the day, you want to have some kind of an inventory where you can have a look at which um, deployed software uses which dependencies. Um, and best case, you want to have that in an automated way. It's cheap because there are a lot of tools out there that can give you at least a somewhat good insight right out of the box. OWASP uh, dependency track, for example, some of you might know that. You deploy it to a customer, uh, to, to a cluster, scan all the images right there, and you have a pretty good idea of which software dependencies you're using in your Kubernetes cluster, for example, or on your VM, um, out of the box. Probably not 100% complete, but you're at least somewhat set. So that's actually quite cheap. And the interesting part here as well is you need to do it once centrally per pipeline or per cluster, and not everybody has to do it. That's why it's actually quite cheap. The other thing is, for example, you can have license checks. As we've seen before with the security checks, this is a central tool you purchase, you use, and you get a somewhat good idea um, of the licenses your dependencies have. If you use proper packages, package managers that also have license information included, but if you do that, there's a pretty good chance you might get a nice and fast overview of the licenses your dependencies use. Out of the box, and since also usually centralized, it's also quite cheap. The expensive part, on the other hand, is, for example, if you're in a highly regulated environment, and that's where we usually work when we work with uh, on-premise installations, on-premise platforms, these companies usually have the, uh, the need to also have their dependencies air-gapped from site. They don't pull anything from the internet, or at least they claim. So you need to make all the dependencies, the packages, the base images, etc., available on site. And the implication of that is you also need to maintain this stuff. You need to maintain the infrastructure. You need to maintain the packages, the images. Somebody needs to make sure that all the packages that are made available to de uh, developers internally are actually safe, approved. Um, so that's actually quite quite high of an effort. And the more packages you use, the more technologies you use, the more expensive it gets. And that's what we see our customers struggle with the most by far, since this usually also involves two or more teams. So there's a lot of communication overhead and yada, yada. Um, the second thing is, if you want to require signed dependencies, so this is the integrity part I talked before, you need to make sure, for example, that you actually trust the right people, the right keys, and that you only use dependencies that are trusted, where integrity is ensured by signed packages. This might be expensive, for example, if your developer relies on a package they found online in which they think, hey, that's cool, that's neat, I want to use that but it doesn't um, stand up to the, um, to the security standard that you have in your company. So if your company requires packages to be signed by one of the trusted public keys um, as a policy, and the developer can't use a certain package because it doesn't adhere to that policy, you need to find a workaround. You either need to develop the code yourself or you need to find some workaround, and that's going to be expensive because usually, for example, if you use, I don't know, JavaScript projects or Python projects, you use a lot of open source projects and some of them are not that that high on the security ranking, if you will. All right, a um, little show of hands again. Who of your developers are already using a package manager? Okay, many hands, that's, that's quite good. Um, who of you already has a, a policy in place that depicts which packages are allowed for use and which not? One, two, three, four, five. That's what we see. <laughs> okay, next stage. The next stage is pretty much the build stage. Um, 
Build actually tr um, refers to the process of converting some kind of source code to some kind of an artifact. Um, we also hear the term CI a lot in this um, in this domain, which means continuous integration. So continuously integrating changes of code into a changed artifact. Um, for this very simple graph, I just want to invite you to not only think in terms of compiled software, so Go code to executable, but try to think on a bigger scale. You could also, for example, build documentation. Docs code, transforming ASCII doc to PDF, for example. Um, configuration as code. So everything that is not compiled, but rather transformed from a source code form to a delivered artifact form. That's what we refer to as build or CI in that case. And that's also what we, where, uh, where we can see, um, attack vectors. So for example, if you think of depend, uh, if, if, um, of docs as code, I can't only hack, um, for example, a C application and insert malicious code there in a, in a compromised compiler. I could just uh, compromise the built environment of uh, uh, dependence uh, docs as code um, build, uh, build environment and add a malicious link to a PDF, stuff like that. So try to not only think in terms of executables and programs, but also in other artifacts. Um, again, here, 